which will be the next uh, speaker on stage. And please welcome. Thank you, Masila. Bye. Hello, everyone. Hi, Nina. Okay, so I shall let you host the stage you now. <laughs> and I okay, will try to present the slides. If any issue, let me know. I'm in the back end. Okay. Okay. Can we? Can you still hear me? Okay. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to try to turn on my um, presentation. So fingers crossed. I like, can you see my presentation? Good. I'm actually moving on the screen. Good. Okay, so thank you everyone for sticking around for my talk, There Is No Box. Um, so you probably all heard the saying, think outside the box. Well, what if I told you that there is no box? I'm Nina, and I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Daru people, who are the traditional custodians of the land that I live and work in. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Technology, Sydney, and I'm a huge 3D printing and bioprinting nerd. I'm also a passionate advocate for creativity and diversity. And as you can see in my profile picture, I'm a certified eternal child. I'm particularly happy to talk at TYPE this year because the People Track has already had really fantastic talks on the individuality and creativity in my industry. And I want to amplify that message. I think. For me, additive manufacturing is an interesting mix of traditional industry and creative design. 3D printing requires lateral thinking when designing complex structures and problem solving the manufacturing process. But we are masters of so much more than our job description, be it through our roles in the wider community or through anything that we are passionate about. And I would like to invite you all to broaden your creative thinking and looking at the design process beyond the industry context. I've got three key takeaways for you today, and they discuss the importance of embracing the background, translating diverse interests into creative solutions, and having confidence in bringing the ideas to life. First one is never apologize for your background. Second one, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And third one, there is no box. So you guys need to hold on to your propeller hat. And here we go. Never apologize for your background. And with this, I mean, you don't need to apologize for a past career or past role you thought, uh, what culture you come from, what gender, what orientation you might be. It's all valid. There's always a learning process and some useful experience. I really want this realization to come back to you a few years ago. And this was the first year of the first week, probably my first lecture, uh, doing completely different to what I had done before. And there was a fellow first year student who asked me, so what's my background? Why, why am I doing the course I'm doing? And I think that this is a career change. I haven't heard it already, but it wasn't the satisfaction anymore that I wanted. And their question was, and I thought, wow, how does it feel having waited all the time studying engineering? After a small course, and after confirming that they did actually ask me that, I replaced the degree in a corporate career, which I can go back to if my career doesn't pan out. Not that I want to. 
and that is that also enabled us to buy a house. We had our car, and we had started a family. So not really waste of time when you think of it. Now to this day, I don't know if they did think of it, but I certainly have over the years thought about the thought. And if I had been a bit more tactful, a bit more diplomatic, instead of literally jumping their head off, I could have talked to them about the business and leadership experience that I had gained and the technical and operational understanding that I have and how I'm using it successfully in my legal career. So my background is very technical. I've worked with um, all the modern industry, uh, with a lot of spare part industries. Um, my biggest chunk of my career was done in operations in supply chain and inventory management. Now I'm doing anatomy. So I'm working with um, biomedical engineering, looking at anatomical aspect of the human heart. How do these two work together? Surprising quite well. So there is a lot that I can draw from my mechanical understanding to use it in anatomy and physiology. Because after all, they all follow the same laws of physics. So what I want you to think is your cultural influence, your cultural background, they all shape us. They shape our thinking, um, what we would have done. And in cultural terms, I also mean where you've worked before, what the company has been like, um, but also obviously your cultural identity, where you grew up and what culture you embraced when you were growing up, or what culture you might be embracing today. I would invite you all to embed your own identity in you somehow. It may not be big, it might be a small thing, it might be a design idea, you're presenting, I put something about your own self into your presentations, but it is all worthwhile. My example of this is a movie director called Remy Harlan. He did, did all these 90s, uh, 1990s um, action movies, and he wanted to embed a person of his Finnish culture to his movies. So if you can watch by half two, and you see the ending scene with the landing, yes, all alert, thank you, land. Um, you can hear part of Finlandia by Sid Elliott, and that was the name. He wanted always to put a little bit of Finland into his movies, and I think that's beautiful. Um, a very concrete example of never apologizing for your background. There was an academic and during my undergrad years who taught us, and he managed to combine two very interesting traits. Um, he had to, when he was younger, to decide if he was going to do science, to be a research scientist, or if he was going to continue doing music. He's a drummer. Probably because of the bills and the reality of the world, he chose to do uh, science and he's a very accomplished and very good molecular biologist. But at the same time, he always continued to make music. When the COVID hit, he took his creative talent and he did what we call sonification of the data. So he took the DNA sequence of the virus and turned it into a piece of music. It's progressive rock and it's quite mind blowing. And it was his hobby almost, but he, he was combining it with his work, how to present his own work. Was it successful? Well, one of the most prestigious journals of science contacted him, Nature. So literally, Nature called him, pun intended. So you never know, you might have a talent, uh, a skill that you can translate into your work, and there might be a very creative outcome to presenting something or solving a problem. So never apologize. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're passionate about, it's important. Now, the pictures here are probably quite familiar to a lot of people in the audience. So yes, sometimes things don't go as planned, but you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. There's, yeah, that's a cliche, I know, but it rings true. Another cliche that I'm going to share with you is this. Fail early, fail often, fail forward. Rather than looking at failing at something, something not working as 
something you're going to scrap and say, no, okay, forget about it. You've just found one way how things do not work. In science, this is really important because we test our scientific uh, hypothesis using a scientific method, trial and error. We try one way, didn't work. Okay, we can eliminate that, try something else. And in work terms, nobody comes to work to fail, but sometimes failing is required for learning. So take the shot. If we don't challenge ourselves, we're going to be staying in the same spot. I think Lisa Block spoke of this very eloquently last year at Type when she was talking about the fear of being great, of the sameness. We have to be courageous enough to go and take the leap. For some reason, kids are really, really fantastic at this, possibly because their imagination is not governed by adult boundaries. But somewhere along the way, the way the joy of doing new things, just because we thought of something new, it gets beaten out of us and then we wake up as adults. That's a bit boring and that's quite limiting. But it takes guts. Even for kids, I'll give you an example. My son, when he was about four and a half, uh, he had started to take risks in the water and we decided, dude, time for you to learn to swim properly. So we took him to swim lessons and he wasn't keen. But when we got to the swimming pool, there was the teacher and he walked to her with a smile and he spent half an hour in the pool with her. And when he got out, he walked to me and said, Mummy, I was scared, but I did it anyway. And that was a very proud parent moment because that's something I can't teach my children. And sometimes the challenge may come from a very surprising source or it's unintended. There was this beautiful lady I used to work with in the corporate environment, and she, like all of us, was suffering from the corporate environment, unfortunately. She would always have this small, nervous laughter when I would talk to her. And there was one particularly difficult day I saw her. She was a bit looking a bit down and asked, So, how's things going? And she was laughing a little, and then she said, Oh, my husband told me that um, breast cancer didn't kill me, but this job might kill you. And I was shocked. I looked at her and I thought, you're a breast cancer survivor. And you're putting yourself down for a job where we're being put on unrealistic expectations that we can't meet and your manager is just not supporting you. Without thinking, these words came out. I looked at her and said, when are you going to start living for yourself? I didn't intend to, they just came out. She looked at me back and she laughed a little and said, how oh, well, you know, and then we continued our day. And from then on, that turned into a bit of an inside job with us. Whenever she would see me, she would say, oh, Nina, when I get to start living for yourself? And we would laugh and then after a while, it wasn't a joke anymore. She came to me and she said, oh, Nina, I've decided to start living for myself. And she had resigned and she had decided to go semi-retired and she was glowing. She was happy that she had taken that opportunity. And a couple of weeks after she left the job, I saw her again and she was just radiant. And she said, I found a new job. I get to help people and there's no pressure and I just turn up and it's wonderful and they're supportive. And I think she was grateful, at least I like to think so, but I don't think you'll ever forget those words, they just came. When are you going to start living for yourself? So that still rings true to me and I hope that's something that some of you might take with you on today's talk. Now similarly, taking the shot. This notion goes both ways. So if you've been lucky enough to employ a creative type in your team, let them thrive. I would like to see the tall poppy culture challenged because that gives us fear. What if we're too different? What if we try something that it's just gonna rub people the wrong way? Well, sometimes with us creative types, you have to listen to 100 crazy ideas to get the one good one, but I almost guarantee you that one big one is going to be the nugget worth digging for. So 
or the variety of experience and talent, it presents many opportunities, but you need to let them get out. If you're in a position of no power, direct power, advocate for us. Maybe say, oh, you know what? Maybe hear it out. Hear, the, hear, hear it out, it doesn't cost anything. If the idea is crazy, yeah, we might not take any further. If it's something worth investigating a bit further, there you go, it was brought out to the open. And the other thing that we've talked about in the, one of the previous talks was, should we just look at 3D printing in terms of engineering and design? Should we bring in more people from ethics and um, sociology and anthropology into the um, process? Yes, because here's the thing that I was driven into during my undergrad studies. You can't do science in silos, which means that if I am doing bioengineering, if I just do bioengineering and my bioengineering bit, that thing that I'm designing for is never going to translate into a treatment for patients because I'm going to need physicians, I'm going to need people who know finance, I'm going to need people who know um, regulation and this, that and the other. So we can't exist in our little silos, we need to branch out and we need to be able and open to understand what other people are telling us. So now, dog for your attention. So there is no box. So how do you help us creative minds? Yes, we realize there are real jobs and there are real bills to pay and there are real KPIs to meet, but to prevent eating of any walls like this dog here, you need to keep us challenged. Not by piling on more routine work, but by giving us something juicy that we can sort of chew and mull around. The same academic that came up with the sonification of the coronavirus talked to us about having an A stream and an B stream of work. His A stream is his work on molecular biology, so that's the bread and butter. And the B stream involves his music and the scientific data. So he has been fortunate because he's been given an environment at work that has encouraged him to investigate that. Uh, he's, I would say he's probably done a lot of that work at his own time, but his work has been encouraging and he's been allowed to flourish in that way as well. So if we find something that keeps that talent side busy and it's benefiting and there's something new coming out, let us and empower us um, and advocate for us if you can, because this is the way you keep it uh, creating types of talent house. So another one, this is probably gonna be my last example for you from my personal experience. When I was coming right out of um, university, when I was graduating from my um, engineering degree, I was interviewed for a role at a huge company back home and I dodged a bullet. It wasn't just a bullet, it was a missile. Um, I will never forget this interview question. I was actually asked, what if you're too creative? To this day, I don't know how to answer that question, but what I do know that that place was a wrong cultural fit for me. If you're in a place that's a wrong cultural fit, you're not going to be very happy in your role. I'm very fortunate today because the lab that I'm working in, I have a very, very supportive supervisor who sees things and sees the influence from other um, avenues that can help us to do science and bioengineering. And in, um, an example of this is we have two artists in residence. They did an art project that relates to what we're doing in the lab. And from that, they realized that hmm, there are a lot of problems that we need to solve until we can translate the, um, the, the treatment that they were investigating from a small mouse model to a large human model. So what they needed was anatomical understanding and someone to scale up uh, the idea from a small to a big. That's where I've been, but that's a time for another talk. So what I would like to see, as it is in the picture next to me, there is no box, but you can turn that box into whatever you want. And 
I would just like to finish by saying that you don't need to think outside the box because there is no box. Have your original thoughts and you know that you do not need to fit. You just need to be accepted. That's admittedly sometimes easier said than done. But a good starting point may be to stop fighting against who you are. Because then things won't come naturally. And there is no path either. At least not one that you can see laid ahead of you. But that's a topic for another talk. But with that note, this was talk by me and Matthews. And I have no idea how I got here, but I thank you all for tuning in. So thank you.